we're going to start with spine anatomy. So what does the spine do? Everybody knows, but let's define it. It supports the body, obviously allows enough motion to position the arms and the head for activities of daily living. It protects the spinal cord and nerve roots. It has shock absorbing capacity and it's resistant to motion to prevent injury. So what we'd all expect. So how does it work? And everybody knows this, but we'll still spend our time on it. So there's five lumbar vertebrae in general, sometimes four, sometimes six, but most of the time five. The discs are of course sandwiched in between the vertebra. The alignment of course is straight on an AP, no scoliosis, and everybody remembers the definition of a scoliosis is a curve 10 degrees or more. So if it's less than 10 degrees by definition, not a scoliosis. And then the lordosis of the lumbar spine is due not to the shape of the vertebra, but to the shape of the discs, which are trapezoidal. The vertebra are square. If you take the discs out and you put the vertebra one on top of another, the spine is straight on a lateral. The discs are what cause the lordosis. So the anterior column, which is the vertebral body, the disc, and the ligaments in front and back, that carries 70% of the normal weight of the spine, which of course conversely means the facets carry 30% of the weight. The discs, of course, absorb shock and allow motion, but have poor resistance to shear forces. All these little facts start to add up, so embed that in your head. The disc is fine for compression, fair for rotation, and really crappy when it comes to shear forces. What resists shear forces are the facets. The facets I like to call the door stops. They are the things that resist the shear forces, and of course, if you remember the lumbar spine lordosis with the sacrum at a 45 degree angle, the lowest two discs have the greatest shear forces and therefore the most strain on the facets. Make sense? Good, I got a head shake so I know you guys are doing okay. So sacroiliac joints. So sacroiliac joints are a very weird joint because they both have diarthrodial and fibrous portions. Diarthrodial is the typical two smooth bony surfaces, all covered with hyaline cartilage, a capsule and synovium and synovial fluid lubricating the joint. So it's a regular joint like a hip knee and an elbow, but the joint also has fibrous tissue like you find in the clavicle, like you find in the pubic symphysis. Aging of joints have less range of motion and normal range of motion is one to two degrees and it's only rare pain generators. We'll talk about this but there's a lot of patients that come into my office with a diagnosis of sacroiliac disorder, and most of the time it's not. So the posterior elements, when we go through the pedicle into the back, we have facets, and they are, of course, restraints of motion. They, I call them railroad tracks. The angles of the facets vary from male to female. Female's more sagittal orientation. Every little fact comes into play. Sagittally, more sagittally faced facets mean there's less ability to resist shear. So that means that women are going to have some problems in the facets greater than men. Spinous processes are flexion restraints because you have the interspinous superspinous ligaments and their extension blockers. As you bend back, they start to abut each other and the pedicles connect the anterior and posterior columns keep looking back at my computer and I don't have to do that. Okay, stabilizing ligaments. So the center of rotation for a normal spine is the posterior one-third of the disc. What does that mean? That's the center where everything in front goes in one direction and everything in back goes the other direction. That's also important for the spinal canal because the spinal canal is in back of the center of rotation and that will change in diameter with different spinal positions. Again, every little fact that I give you is going to add up to something much bigger later. Flexion is restricted by the capsules back here, by the supraspinatus and interspinous ligaments, and by the abutment of the vertebral bodies. Does that all make sense so far? I got two head shakes, this is good. Okay, so what's normal sagittal alignment? Is this important? Yes. So a lumbar lordosis is normally 40 to 60 degrees. 
The sacral angle is normally 45 degrees. A thoracic kyphosis is 20 to 40 degrees. The cervical lordosis is 30 to 40 degrees. Center of C7 should be right over the sacral ala. And all of the curves added together should balance each other. Because if there's one curve that's less than another or greater than another, you have to compensate. Compensation can create problems. Again, another little pearl. So, as I said before, and we'll keep hounding on this, disc asymmetric shapes are responsible for all of the kyphosis and lordosis. So if you pile the vertebra one on top of another, it's going to be a straight spine. So multifidi and rotators. I hear a lot about this today, and we'll talk about how they're not as important as people think they are. But these are the multifidi and rotators. The erector spiny group is on the side here. And action is extension of the lumbar vessels, of vertebra or resisted flexion. So we're going to talk at length about the core muscles, the anterior core muscles, the rectus, the internal obliques, the external obliques. And we'll talk about how they work. And then we'll talk about the posterior muscle contractions, the erector spiny group, which doesn't do as much as you might think, which is important to understand for rehabilitation. And there, again, as I talked about, remember the center of rotation. When you bend forward, this is the center. Things in front compress, things in back distract. And when you bend backward, the same exact thing. Things in front distract, things in back compress. That's important. Okay. Any questions about that? 